Hello, my name is Martin Frank. I'm industrial PhD student at the Blakinger Institute of Technology. And today I'm joined by Marco Cantamesa from the Politecnico di Torino in Italy. And welcome, Marco, and uh, thank you for taking the time for this small interview. Thank you for being the time invited me. <laughs> yeah. So, Marco, today you gave a really interesting and inspiring keynote speech about shaping the future through design. And along this um, presentation, you had kind of interesting connections or not existing connections between technology and science. And then on the other hand, technology and design. But a few slides later, you mentioned that there is much more to consider. So what are the additional disciplines, skills or tools we need to consider when we really would like to make a dent or to, to shape the future. So is it only the technology and only the academia and the designers or what else do or who else do we need to include? Um, well, I think that the problem lies mostly in, in the mindset of academics who love to create academic fields and then put walls between the fields. So if you look at real life, the point is that technology and design are very hard to distinguish because in the end, whenever you're developing technology, you're designing and whenever you're designing, you're actually developing technology. But if you look at the academic fields, technology management, technology policy, whatever, um, usually treat technology as a black box. And we as designers are living within the black box, but we don't have the big picture. So I think this is something that of course, I mean, academic, um, fields exist because this allows you to go deeper, but sometimes you lose pieces. And I think the point that we are losing here is, first of all, the capability um, to understand how design is being, let's say, carried out, especially when technology is its in, in its infancy. And technologies have to be shaped leading to a dominant design. And we don't really know how to design in that particular uh, environment, which is quite, let's say, striking because this means that the, the word and the experience of the people in design is unheard um, at the level of technology strategy and policy. And this is particularly relevant today um, when so many changes are being carried out um, through design, but without that design shaping the, the, the public discourse. And I think this is the, the major problem that we're dealing with today. Mm -hmm. No, that's a great answer because yeah, design is everywhere, but you need to make it obvious. So that's yeah. quite interesting. Uh, what I really found really, or what I really found interesting was um, where you explained the connection between hardware and software design and that it's often really, really difficult to distinguish or to bring it together because there are hardware design loops, there is stuff, software design loops. And it seemed to me that it was more targeted towards consumer products, but have you all also done research in the area of investment products? So meaning the crane stuff you see behind me or big machines, construction machines where my domain is or um, trucks. So have you ever considered this as a research topic? Uh, I haven't personally done research in that environment, but I think that in these cases, it's even, let's say, tougher because when you're dealing with capital equipment, uh, the life cycle of the crane is much longer um, and the life cycle of the software that runs it is even shorter. Exactly. So what happens in that case is it's really like, um, I mean, the, the example I ran during the speech was about uh, infrastructure. So it's basically like designing a motorway in such a way that it will accommodate traffic patterns for the years to come. And that is very similar. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, you're designing a crane that will probably be there for 20, 30 years. Uh, it will be maintained and maybe a lot of spare parts will be changed. But most of all, the firmware and the software that runs it will evolve a number of times. Um, and we still haven't considered this approach to design yet. We, we, we are frozen in a world where you design an artifact where the hardware and software have the same life cycle, which is quite ridiculous, of course. Yes, now that is uh, actually was my follow-up question about the life cycle, because it's 
typically really different uh, in these type of products. But you mentioned that, for example, Alphabet failed in creating hardware products because it's a software company. Well, but what is the case vice versa? If we, for me, working at Volvo as a hardware product, a hardware company developing software products, will that work? Or what is your opinion on that? <laughs> Let's put it this way, that the company who will be able to uh, crack the distance between hardware and software design will be so very successful. Now, whether this will come from the software people learning how to do hardware or from the hardware people learning how to do software, Oh, this is up for grabs, I would say. Uh, Tesla is showing it beautifully. I mean, Tesla is really showing how they're able to develop hardware in such a way that will accommodate software um, up and coming. I mean, the idea they had about embedding sensors used for automotive, automated driving, even without using them yet, but then enabling in the future, that was, I mean, this really shows the, the way forward. Now, the, the point is, Tesla has shown it in the world of cars, and uh, maybe Volvo will be able to do it in the world of cranes. Yeah, we will see. So it's an interesting future. And talking about the future, so you as a founding member of the Design Society some, I guess, 20, 30 years ago, have you envisioned uh, that we, some years later, are at this stage with the Design Society and with the ISET? Have you already envisioned that during the funding process as a visionary guy like you are? It was hard to tell where we would have ended. Um, what I must say is that I've seen a lot of change in in, in the discussions and the conversations that are taking place, um, reacting very quickly to the to a fast changing world, and I'm admired by that. I mean, the idea that software has taken over so quick, and academics in the world of I said instead of sticking to their guns, have followed through in the real challenges that are ahead of us. Um, I think it's quite interesting and very noteworthy, I would say. Um, still, more has to be done. Um, we should not be chasing industry. Uh, industry should be inspired by us mm -hmm. um, if we are successful academics, and we are still not there yet. We're running abreast instead of leading, um, and this is, we have to improve. And if all wishes came through, where will we be in, in 30 some years? in your opinion? <laughs> uh, hard to tell. It, it's very hard to tell. Um, I don't know. I, I think we do have very significant challenges. Um, things are changing ever faster. And my big concern is that, um, in a way, technology is changing faster than the capability of society to understand what is the proper, whatever proper means, use of technology. So, um, I mean, we risk running into a runaway world like Black Mirror sort of things or Huxley, if you want to stick to old fashioned books. Um, and we have, to, I think we have to be very careful about this. This also is a responsibility for people in technology like us, um, because if we stay within our labs, um, the, the risk of runaway technology is always there. Um, and instead, we should actually spend time discussing technology with, with people, with people in a broad sense, of course, uh, to make sure everybody's aware about the pros and also the cons of technology to avoid running it away. All right, then I think with that said, let's shape the future through design. Marco, thank you for your time and thank you for the interview. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.